So let's start then. So today um, we want to do what is essentially the archetypical quantum mechanics problem. And the reason why it's, it's, it's such an important problem is because it captures a whole class of different things, not just the hydrogen atom, but also a whole class of um, uh, potential problems where the potential is really what we call a central potential. Gravities um, of this form, at least Newtonian gravities of this form, uh, the Coulomb interaction is of this form. That's why this is such an important problem and, and it's, you know, we need to make sure that we understand how to solve the Schrodinger equation with this potential. So we want to study central potentials, which is going to lead us to um, the confluent hypergeometric equation whose solution is confluent hypergeometric functions, which um, we dealt with in the last lecture. Um, and we'll round off the, the lecture with um, writing down and using the integral representation for the hypergeometric function to work out an integral representation for the uh, confluent hypergeometric function. All right, very good. So let's get started then. Um, <clears throat> the example that I want to work on right now is the hydrogen atom. Um, and essentially what we want to do is solve a time independent Schrodinger equation. So we're gonna use natural units um, so the hydrogen atom um, consists of solving the Schrodinger equation, um, the time dependent Schrodinger problem um, and I'm going to use units of h bar equal to m equal to one, just because I'm interested in the solution of the differential equation, not especially interested in the physics of the problem, which is not to say it's not interesting, it's just that this is a course in mathematical physics or mathematical methods. And so we want to strip away the bells and whistles of the problem and just focus on the, on the math. That's the problem we want to solve. Um, minus a half del squared far, uh, psi plus some potential V of R psi acting, um, sorry, equal to E of psi. This is the um, uh, wave function as usual. This is the central potential that we're interested in. And it's called a central potential because it really just is, depends on how far away um, uh, from the source of the potential you are. So think about a Coulomb interaction, for example, um, that's an example of a central potential. So where everything could be a function, whether, where V could be a function of X, Y, and Z, um, it's really not, it's really a function of how far away from the source you are. In particular, we're going to be interested in um, the potential V of R equal to uh, minus some Z E squared over R, where this Z here is the atomic number and E is the electron charge. So this is the atomic number. And this is the uh, electron charge. Um, and this is the energy of the atom, energy eigenvalue. Okay, <clears throat> with this potential, um, given that it's a central potential, our eigenvalue for a problem can be written as a differential equation, which we then have to solve. So 
with this potential, then we have to solve the following. So we need to solve the differential equation. It looks like this. So essentially del squared psi plus two times the energy. I'm bringing it over to the uh, right-hand side, uh, to the left-hand side, plus two z e squared over r times psi equals zero. So a phrase like this, this doesn't seem like that difficult a problem to solve. However, keep in mind that we are working in three dimensions, three spatial dimensions. And so, um, <clears throat> and so the Laplacian that we're working with takes a very particular form, okay? So we are interested in a central potential and one simplifying um, aspect of this is that um, we expect that the system has spherical symmetry, which means that the wave function is only a function of how far away from the origin you are. Um, so with spherical symmetry in the problem, V, oh, sorry, psi, is just a function of how far away from the origin you are. And the Laplacian del squared, the Laplacian operator, can be written as minus one over r squared times an angular operator. So this is the angular momentum operator. L squared plus one over R. I will expand on what L squared is just now. D by dr of R D by dr plus one over R D by dr, like such. And this guy, L squared, is equal to um, minus one over sine theta d by d theta of sine theta d by d theta minus one over sine squared theta d phi squared, so d by d phi squared. Okay, in fact, let me use var phi squared. All right, so that's the angular momentum operator, the square of the angular momentum operator. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we have a differential equation we'd like to solve. Um, we know that uh, we're going to be able to simplify the problem because psi is just a function of r. But let's assume we didn't know that for the moment, right? Let's assume that we just had this, this three-dimensional problem that we wanted to solve. How would you solve this partial differential equation? Well, the way I would solve the partial differential equation <coughs> of this form is to take a is to take a separable ansatz for psi. So I will assume that I can write psi in a form that separates out the radial part and the angular part. So separable ansatz for psi means that we will write psi, which in polar coordinates is a function of r, theta, and phi as some 
R of R times some, just following tradition here, Y, which will be a function of theta and phi. So that's just the radial dependence times just the angular dependence. In which case, my Schrodinger equation becomes the following. <clears throat> If I take that and substitute it into the equation that I wrote above, and in fact, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to define an effective potential, this guy here. Um, so let's define this as V effective. So my Schrodinger equation will treat del squared by psi plus V effective psi equals zero. Now reads, now reads minus one over y times L squared acting on y plus r over capital R d by dr of r dr by dr plus r over r d r by d little r plus r squared v effective equals zero, All right? So the standard thing here, I'll take the psi, which I've assumed can be separated, plug it into the differential equation, divide by psi, and I split off things into one piece that just involves y's and one piece that just involves um, uh, capital R's, right? So some, some piece that just involves the angular piece, some piece that just involves um, the um, radial piece. And the fact that these two enter in the same equation um, <clears throat> means that the only way they're going to cancel out is if, that they're, is if they're equal to a constant. And I'm going to use that fact call this constant uh, minus alpha here. And if that's minus alpha, then this has got to be plus alpha, okay? Um, yeah, okay. So <clears throat> by the usual observations that one would make when one is um, working with separation of variables, the angular and radial parts must be equal to a constant. That's what we just said. In this case, um, it follows then that what we have are two equations. The first one says that, the first one says that um, L squared acting on Y of theta and phi must equal to alpha y of theta and phi. And the second one says that d2 r by dr squared plus two over r dr by dr plus this effective potential uh, minus alpha over r squared um, r equals zero. Okay. As usual, the thing that we've accomplished um, out of this is to take the partial differential equation and split it up into two ordinary differential equations. Now I'm going to make the additional um, uh, assumption that everything just depends on R only. In other words, I don't need to worry about what's going on with the radial equation. In fact, what I'll get there is spherical harmonics, but I don't really need to worry about that. I want to worry just about the radial part, the radial equation. So we're just going to concern ourselves with this differential equation. Okay, it is a second order ordinary differential equation for R. And the way I'm going to treat this, so let's focus on this. Let's make a note of that.
what I'm going to treat this is by making a change of variables. So what I want to do is I want to get rid of the first derivative term, this 2 over r d by dr. And the way to do that is to rescale the, the wave function. So I'm going to define u of r to be r times capital R of r. In which case, if I substitute into the differential equation, my differential equation reads d2u by dr squared plus um, 2 times e plus 2z e squared over r minus l times l minus 1 over r squared acting on u of r equals zero. And here you will notice that I have chosen to write alpha as L times L minus one, because I know the form of the eigenvalues I'm gonna get from the angular equation and I'm just being consistent with the literature. Okay, this is just convention. There's nothing deep about this. This is just the structure of um, the angular eigenvalues. Okay, so this is starting to take shape. I have second order differential equation um, in U with just second derivative term and um, a linear term. Now, it's not quite what I want because the form that I want to be able to recognize is the is something that resembles the hypergeometric form or the confront hypergeometric form. Um, and it turns out that I can do that. And in fact, not only can I do that, the boundary conditions are going to dictate for me what the energy eigenvalues are for this problem. Um, and to do that, we do the following. First thing is I want to rescale the radial variable r and cost it in terms of a new variable, um, z. So let's rescale r by writing it as some constant k times little z, okay? And I'm gonna fix this constant um, k just now. So this is a constant to be fixed. So with this, we'll find that um, the differential equation reads d2u by dz squared plus 2e k squared plus 2 capital Z e squared k over little z minus L into L plus one. Sorry, that should be a plus here. over z squared times u equals zero. Okay, now I get to make some choices. And in particular, I'm going to choose choose k, or I'm going to choose k squared equal to minus one over eight E. So this just determines my scaling. I'm not changing any physics of the problem here, right? And I'm going to define now alpha. Okay, I, I appreciate that this is a bit um, abusive notation because I've used alpha before, but this is a new alpha. Um, so this is going to be z e squared over the square root i times z e squared over the square root 
of 2e. And I'm going to choose beta to be defined as L times L plus one. So again, I apologize for the shifty notation here, but um, I think it's consistent once you once you follow it through. Upshot is the differential equation that we're working with then reads d2u by dz squared plus minus a quarter, killed off all of the e and k squared dependence, plus alpha over z minus beta over z squared times u equal to zero. Okay, nearly there. This is nearly in the form that we want. Um, and to make the final uh, transition to um, final transition to the confluent hypergeometric function, I need to do the following. So finally, um, I'm going to define a new function f. And f is going to be related to u by setting u, which is a function of z, to be z to the mu. Here is a parameter, e to the minus mu z times f of z. Um, and I'm going to choose mu squared to be a quarter and beta, the beta that we just defined as mu times mu minus one. If I plug this back into the differential equation, I will find that it reads d2f by dz squared plus two mu over z minus one df by dz minus mu minus alpha over z times f equals zero. So this is already in the form of the confluent hypergeometric function. So this is, uh, sorry, confluent hypergeometric equation. So let's make a note of this. This is a confluent hypergeometric equation. Um, and now to solve these equations, I need boundary conditions because this is a second order differential equation. To solve any second order differential equation, I need to supply you with boundary data. And the boundary data is going to determine the, the specific solutions. So boundary data um, for this problem, we take as follows. Yeah, sort of, yeah. mm -hmm. Can we just go back? back? Sure. Is that because you're still writing? No, 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 no. Uh, oh, you have a question. It might have been a mistake. I'm going to double check. Here, uh, under the R is equal to KZ, we have 2E K squared. And we said K squared is minus 1 over 2E, right? Yeah. No, one is minus 1 over 8E. Oh, it's minus 1 over 8E. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Let me make that clear. Okay, so the boundary data for this problem is that I require that the wave function be normalizable. Um, so this is one. Um, so we require 
formalizability. of the wave function. In other words, I require that the integral over three space of mod psi squared d three x be finite. And point two is that I require that um, the wave function at r equals zero be finite. This condition up here means that in terms of u, I require that u of z goes to zero as z goes to infinity. So this is how this translates to um, this is how this translates to the u function that we defined. Um, and you can check above that this is consistent with our choice of nu equal to a half. And this condition um, requires that u at zero um, must be finite, which in turn demands that mu must be L plus one, which is again consistent with our um, choices. Now we have some constraints on the problem. With these constraints, so with these constraints, we find the following that the differential equation that we want to solve reads z times f double prime, where prime here means differentiate with respect to z, ordinary derivative with respect to z. So z f double prime plus two times L plus one minus z f prime plus L plus one minus alpha f equals zero, which gives us a solution in terms of u of z as some constant times z to the L plus one times e to the minus z over two times the confluent hypergeometric function one f one whose parameters are L plus one minus alpha, two times L plus one and Z. Keeping in mind what I said in the last lecture that essentially, um, <clears throat> essentially that um, the confluent hypergeometric function is derivable from the geometric hypergeometric, sorry, from the hypergeometric function um, by making uh, two of its three singularities um, confluent um, to bring them together at infinity, okay? So this is not quite what I want. In fact, I'm going to leave the next step for you as an exercise. To show that um, in terms of psi, the final solution, the final version of the solution, is psi, which is labeled by n and l, and a function of r is constant r to the l e to the minus z r over n times a naught. A naught here is the ball radius. I'll define that for you just now. Uh, one f one of 
minus n plus l plus one, 2l plus two, uh, two z r over n a naught, same a naught. And this guy here is the ball radius. Um, which is defined to be h bar squared over m times the electron charge squared. All right, this is the final version of the solution with, and if you plug this into the differential equation, you will find that this only holds um, if the energy levels take on a quantized value um, of minus z squared m e to the four over two h bar squared n squared, All right? We're, and n here is some integer n plus l plus one, okay? I'm gonna leave that as an exercise for you. And that solves the problem of the hydrogen atom. So we worked out the wave functions, the, eigen, the eigenfunctions, as well as the energy eigenvalues for the problem. And this is one of the standard problems of, um, of quantum mechanics. And this is how you solve it using um, the, by converting the problem into one of the confident hypergeometric equation and its solutions. So finally, I want to give a, um, an integral representation for the um, confident hypergeometric function because this will be quite useful um, at a later stage. So we want to give an integral representation for the confront hypergeometric function whose parameters are, let's say, alpha, gamma, um, and independent variable z. And to do this, we note the following. This 1f1 confront hypergeometric function of alpha, gamma, and z, I get by taking a particular limit the limit here is as beta goes to infinity, as I discussed in the last lecture, of the hypergeometric function 2f1, whose parameters were alpha, beta, gamma, but I needed to rescale to push that singularity out to infinity, z by z, uh, by sending it to z over beta. The trick here is to recognize that the hypergeometric function is symmetric in its first and second parameters. In other words, this limit is the same as the limit as beta goes to infinity of 2f1 of beta alpha gamma z over beta, which is the limit as beta goes to infinity of gamma of gamma gamma of alpha gamma of gamma minus alpha this is why i switched the two parameters here integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus t z over beta to the minus beta, t to the alpha minus one, one minus t to the gamma minus alpha minus one, integrated respect to t, okay? 
this is just the integral representation for the um, hypergeometric function. And now I want to take the limit as beta goes to infinity. This is easy enough to do in this case because I've isolated the beta dependence to just that first term. And the first term is one minus Tz over beta um, to the minus beta as beta goes to infinity. That becomes an exponential. So this is nothing but gamma of little gamma over gamma of alpha, gamma of gamma minus alpha, integral zero to one, e to the tz, t to the alpha minus one, one minus t to the gamma minus alpha minus one dt, and this is nothing but one f one of alpha gamma z. And there you have it. That's the integral representation that we were seeking. Okay, so as far as the goals we set out for to today, we've um, we've achieved them. Sorry, there's a caveat here in that I need, as usual, the real part of gamma to be bigger than the real part of alpha to be positive um, in order for the integral to converge. So um, let's make that. Let's put that down. For real part of gamma bigger than the real part of alpha bigger than zero. Okay, very good. So that brings us to an end of this section. Um, next week, we will start looking at um, the theory of Green's functions. Um, for those of you who, well, everybody should have a copy of my notes now. Um, if you are unfamiliar with the ideas um, of Green's functions um, in its elementary sense, the sense that you would encounter in second year, then I'd, um, I would refer you to my notes and just for you to refresh your memory about that. So we're going to do some more formal stuff um, with Green's functions um, and how they relate to resolvent to operators and essentially something like Feynman diagrams um, uh, from next week. All right.